This is the kind of thing I've been finding. This is from 198. And the title, I'll read the title and then I'll show you what it looks like. Newport's would be rival, now a wilderness. How Portsmouth failed to check the prosperity of our sister community. Yay! <laughs> so it looks like. And it, it talks about Portsmouth being a wasteland. It's really funny. 19, 1908. Anyway, I'll leave it up here, but if you look at it, please handle very, very, don't, don't handle it. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's good for setting the mood. I'm going to talk tonight about gentlemen's farms. What is a gentleman's farm? Well, in most cases, they are a series of farms that were here in South Portsmouth, most of which we can still identify, although they aren't gentlemen's farms anymore, but uh, where people from New York, Boston, wherever, came to Newport for the season in the Gilded Age, 1880s, 1890s, and decided that they wanted to put commercial farms out in the, out, way out in the countryside. And the ones that I talk about most in terms of my book are Oakland Farm across the street, Sandy Point Farm down the road, and Glen Farm across the street too. And these were, uh, these were huge farms in the 1890s, 1900 period. Most of them were in the vicinity of 500 acres, okay? And I, my, I've written this book on the gentleman farms a few years ago, but what I'm going to do today is to just talk about one, Glen Farm. So bear with me as I get this started the right way. You all know where that is. If, if I'm in anybody's way, please tell me. I can move a little bit, not much though. I got cords everywhere. And afterwards, when, if you're walking around, I have a lot of stuff for display up here. And if you want to come up and look at it, just watch these cords. I will take them down when I'm done, so. Okay, the name associated with Glen Farm is the Taylor family. And the Taylor family, we don't remember much about, as we do the Vanderbilts, Reginald at Sandy Point, Alfred Gwynn at Oakland. Um, so, but the Taylors were quite prominent. Here is the founding father, sort of, Moses Taylor. I think he was, I've done some genealogy on this stuff, but Moses Taylor, I think he was about the third or fourth and there are about seven or eight altogether. In fact, one of whom I met a few years ago out, uh, who lived out in Denver. This Moses Taylor was a very prominent businessman in the banking industry especially. That was his uh, area of concern. And again, one of the wealthiest people in the United States. During his lifetime, in most of the 19th century, Moses controlled the National Bank, uh, National City Bank of New York. It later came to be known as Citibank. We all know, are familiar with that name. He also, they, the Taylors also had a large number of railroads. And the heart of their railroad industry was in the vicinity of Scranton, Pennsylvania, in eastern Pennsylvania. <coughs> he was a financial advisor to Abraham Lincoln during the, during the Civil War. He had business interests in Scranton in that area, also in New York, and helped finance the first transatlantic cable. At his death, they named a hospital after him in Scranton. It's the Moses Taylor Hospital, and to my knowledge, it's still there. And that's a picture of it back, that's a postcard of it, probably from about 1908, 1909, somewhere around there. Okay, I'm gonna be giving you a lot of genius. I have, I have a long presentation, by the way, bear with me. I have about 50 slides, so just stand by. Some of them are just pictures, though. Okay, Moses Taylor married Catherine Wilson, and they had six children, four girls and two boys. And of interest to us is one of the boys in particular. His name was Henry Augustus Coit Taylor, or Hack, and you can see it was done either way. He was born in 1841. He is the primary creator of Glen Farm. And I'll get into that, how that happened. He was involved in all the family businesses, and especially the railroads, the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western, the Cayuga, the Susquehanna railroads, all these uh, big time sort of support railroads, more than the Pennsylvania and the New York Central. Of course, the Vanderbilts had the New York Central, so 
That was under their control. He had a home in New York City at three, and, and this number is important for a reason I'll show you later on, at three East 71st Street and Fifth Avenue, very prime neighborhood in New York City. And his was one of the finest homes in the city, and this is it. Okay. That's where he lived on 70, uh, East 71st Street. But again, with like a lot of other people in that era, they lived in New York, but they came up here for the, for the summer, for the season. And the season was usually some, somewhere around July 4th, uh, well into September. So they came here in the 50s and 60s, when Newport was, in the Gilded Age, was emerging as, the, uh, as a summer resort. The term Gilded Age is kind of interesting because Mark Twain said that the reason it's called the Gilded Age is because it's gold leaf. It's not really gold. So that's where the term came from. H.A.C. Taylor graduated from Columbia in 1861 and a master's degree in 64. He married the daughter of Daniel B. Fearing. Daniel B. Fearing had a house, summer house, uh, on Narragansett Avenue in Newport. Anyway, uh, uh, Annandale Road is where they were, and Henry built one there himself in 1886. And you'll see a picture of it the next slide, but it was designed by the very famous architectural firm of McKinn, Mead, and White. And that's the house. It doesn't look like a really fancy house, but it was huge. And where that was is if you go down to Annandale Avenue in Newport, over to the left, if you're going towards Salve, over to the left is like, like a compound of houses, and it was in there. That's where his house was. So he was a very active man, H.A.C. Taylor, in a lot of what went on in Newport. Again, the, the things are listed here. Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Casino, a member of the Board of Directors of the Reading Room, member of the Newport Golf Club, Chamber of Commerce, Newport Improvement Association, and a patron of the Newport County Fair. The Newport County Fair was an event that was held in Portsmouth. Um, the county fairgrounds are right across the street and up on the hill from St. Barnabas. That's where the fairgrounds were. And Mayor Hall, which is the, uh, the, the construction company house there and was the roller rink a few years ago. I'm sure some of you remember that. Uh, that was part of the uh, complex at the county fair, plus the Grange Hall, of course, down on East Main Road. Anyway, HAC by his second wife, Josephine Whitney, had three children. And these are very important in this story. I will be mentioning one of them in particular. Henry Richmond Taylor was one son. Moses Taylor was another. And he had a daughter, Harriet, who married into royalty in Italy. She became the Countess, I have trouble with this one, Gerardesca. And they lived in the vicinity of, uh, uh, in northern Italy. She'll come up again too, you'll see. So Henry was a really interesting character. I, I have had access to, <coughs> to some of his, uh, uh, some things in the newspaper about him. His obituary was kind of a good sketch of the man, and this is what it said. Mr. Taylor was bluff and persistent in manner and frequently expressed his disapproval of things in a positive manner. But no one ever doubted his honesty or his interest in what he considered to be the best for Newport. His judgment was respected, although many could not agree with him. And it also says, in the, that was in the Daily News, and in the, the Newport Mercury, it says, he moved from Newport to Portsmouth following dissatisfaction with the tax assessment in the city. <laughs> That's probably not unusual. Out into that wilderness out there north in the northern part of the island. <laughs> okay, when his father died in 18, when Henry's father died in 1882, uh, <laughs> Henry had a huge inheritance, uh, and he began to buy up farms in, out, way out in rural Portsmouth, and along the East Main Road especially. Oakland Farm was already here. Oakland Farm had been started in the 1860s and turned over to the Vanderbilts in the 1880s, and Sandy Point had been a farm before Reginald Vanderbilt got into it, and he, he took it over in 1902. So he had a house somewhere on the farm, and I, I've checked the directories and everything else. I'm not sure where. All it says is on, uh, on Glen Farm. 
Anyway, so I'm not sure where he was. He obviously was not in the manor house, by the way. Okay, it wasn't there yet. So he had put together a, f a collection of farms, and there were a lot of farms in Portsmouth. Portsmouth. Portsmouth was a real rural town. And there were a lot of farms all over the place around here, and especially in what we locals like to call, we locals here like to call South Portsmouth. Call, a lot of these farms were small farms. Some of them were as much as 40, 50 acres. One of them was even bigger than that that he bought. He bought up all these farms and had a, had a farm that was, could be measured from Sandy Point Avenue, East Main Road, the Sakana River, and Glen Road. All of it. Everything in there. And where there were some cases people who didn't really want to sell their farm to him, he finally sold it to them, and then he moved their houses off the property. <laughs> so he was, he was a real aggressive kind of person. The husbandry there, the, the cows and horses and things like that, Guernsey cows and horses, sheep, bulls, and all sorts of uh, farm produce as well, as well what became the basis for the farm. And, and I have a comment about the farm that I'll tell you a little bit further on here. It was just amazing. New barns were built. Excuse me a second. I'm going to knock over that microphone. New barns were built in the early 1900s. You still have the dates on them. If you wander through there at all, you can see the dates up above. The, the two that are most prominent are 1902 and 1911. And they're still standing you know, 110, 120 years later. The, the, the farm was self-contained. It had its own fire department, its own telephone system, its uh, own power plant. You know, down over the hill in the valley there, there's a, the remains of a power station. That was to produce power for the farm. They had their own system. They still got taxed a lot, by the way, though. Outbuildings. There were a lot of outbuildings on the farm, and the farm was somewhat self-contained. There was an old 18th century mill on the property. And the mill, is, it's a fascinating story because the mill is just down below the horse barns and the stream for the mill actually ran through the basement of the mill. Turned the gears on the equipment and that turned the machinery up above. Typical mill. And the, uh, later it was con converted into a carpenter shop. On the wall of that mill, is this plaque that you see on the right here. And what it says, if I can read it right, is H.A.C. Taylor, 3 East 71st Street, New York. It's a, I don't know, what's, what is it? I can't forget what kind of metal it is. Anyway, that was in the middle, of, in, on the wall in the mill. Well, we've been very blessed by two people who took over that mill and decided to restore it and make it into a house. And Aaron and the Chapmans are here, Aaron and Jonathan. And that's what it looks like day before yesterday. <laughs> Beautiful. It's really great. <laughs> it's a great asset in terms of the historic renovation of, of a building. I mean, it's outstanding. So I think we really should be very proud. And if you walk down Glen Farm Road, take a look at it. It's right there. Henry Taylor died in May of 1921. He was 80 years old, and he had brought the Glen Farm from a collection of, of small farms to a really exquisite gentleman's farm. The term gentleman's farm is, is something that wasn't so much used then. You'd hear it every once in a while, but it really was uh, it's more of a construct of looking back. And this farm had animals that were known throughout the competitive show world, not just the Newport County Fair, uh, for their outstanding quality. And the farm, they, they participated, in, I've seen articles, they had some of their animals in Kansas City and a lot in New York, all over the country. So, and again, to remind you who HAC was, his obituary said that a number of years ago, Mr. Taylor purchased the Glen in Portsmouth and several adjoining estates and developed a farm which became famous throughout the country for its Clydesdale horses, uh, Jersey and Alderney cow cows, and for the latest breeding improvements. 
Glenn Farm products have been exhibited at the Newport County Fair and all over, and his horses and cattle were easily the best to be seen anywhere. We have a few stored away in a barn, but there are, uh, there are just tons of ribbons from these competitions. We have some of them in our, in our barn out here, uh, and there's, there are more put away. They obviously haven't weathered that well in 100 years, but, uh, but it's really interesting to see them. Henry left his Glen Farm, and remember, he has a house in New York. He had for a while a house in Newport, and then he got the farm. And, and a lot of these people did that. The Vanderbilts did that as well. Although, as it turned out, ultimately, William H. Vanderbilt, who was born in 1901, uh, when his father died, Alfred Gwynne Vanderbilt, at, uh, on the Lusitania, on his way to Europe for a, a show, um, they, they really... The family just held on to those properties for a long time. I'm going to tell you what happened in the Glen. Some of you remember, I'm sure. Okay, but he left Glen Farm to his two children, Moses and Henry uh, Taylor. The Countess was over in Italy. They didn't, I don't think she figured it in. She probably got a cash settlement. Anyway, um, Henry, as far as we can tell, sold his interest in Glen Farm to uh, Moses. And... Uh, so we're dealing from now on, from this point on, we're dealing with Moses Taylor uh, and, and as the main person in the line of Glen Farm. He had been working very closely with his father uh, going back a number of years. They had talked for a long time about building a manor house, something appropriate, of course, to the Glen Farm property. And, and plans were made. They started thinking about it in the 1900-192 period, but it didn't get done. For a while. So there's a lot of, this, uh, had, a lot had been discussed about that, but the exact location of where he was summering on the farm somewhere, uh, we don't know. They said the directories just say East Main Road. Anyway, the house plans have been in work for several years, and so, whoops, went the wrong way. An architect was chosen to design the manor house, and the person that was chosen was John Russell Pope. John Russell Pope was one of the, the exquisite architects of the day, and his firm was quite prominent. You have his birth, date, birth and death dates there. Uh, he really was a, a top-notch architect at that time. I'm going to show you some of the things he built in a minute, or he designed, rather. Um, so all kinds of different architectural styles, Gothic, Classic, and Georgian, really. John Russell Pope at, was asked to design the Glen Manor House in the style of a French chateau with some Italian features. For example, when you're on the, the, the loggia, the porch on the south side, uh, that's very Italian, the way the, the porch is designed. But, and some of the interior feature, features were too. He used as his model, which is kind of an interesting thing, a French palace called the Petit Trianon. Trianon. Petit Trianon is at Versailles. If you've ever been to Versailles, Versailles is the huge palace there. And way out in the country, down past the waterway, are the Petit and the Grand Trianon. And so what uh, Pope did in his designs was to copy some of the interior design work from the Petit Trianon. And I'm going to show you pictures of that in a couple of minutes. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the smaller palaces, but it's huge. Of course, nothing can compare with Versailles if you've ever been. Has, how many of you have been to Versailles? Just curious. Isn't that an awesome <laughs> experience? Wow. Couldn't even walk through. It's so crowded with people. Anyway, that's extraordinary. Okay, so one of the stories about the manor house, though, and it's the design of the manor house, relates to the fact that Moses' earl, eldest son, Moses, uh, was, in, was a soldier in World War I. And he was, he, he was killed in World War I, and he died on the steps of a particular mansion in southern France. Not the Petit Trinon, but one like it. And so the thinking here was, as it's, it's a rumor, it's not really absolutely confirmed, was that uh, they were going to design it much like that particular palace where he had died during World War II in March of 1918. World War I, excuse me, World War I. Here are some of Pope's designs. Okay, the National Archives, 
the West Wing of the National Gallery of Art, and the Jefferson Memorial. Although he died before it was finished, his firm finished the Jefferson Memorial. So he was pretty well known and pretty, pretty, pretty rich too, I'll bet. Anyway, he has, he's, he has quite a reputation as a, an outstanding architect uh, during that period. Okay. Here's some of the interiors. On the left, you see the, at the top, you see the Petit Trianon stairway. And then on the right, you see the Glen Manor House stairway. There's a lot of similarities there if you really look at them. And then on the bottom, the Glen Manor uh, room there, the living room there, and the Petit Trianon, which again are interesting comparisons of design. There were more. I, I've never been to the Petit Trianon, but I had a friend who went there and I said, you gotta take some pictures of what looks like the manor house there, and she did. Okay. The plans for the manor house were completed by Pope in September of 1921 and construction started soon after. And you can, ima you can imagine the construction crew that descended on that piece of property. And, and by the way, if you really think about it and look at it, it is the most extraordinary place to put a mansion. I mean, with the river behind and everything, it's just really a perfect, perfect spot. Meanwhile, as the plans were getting done and the construction was beginning, HAC died. And of his two sons, Henry and, and Moses, Moses and his wife Edith, had been closely working with him on the design of the manor house construction, and they continued to oversee that construction. Okay. They decided that, the, that, that with all this property, and they had as much of 500 acres as they wanted, frankly, uh, but the area around the manor house was uh, going to be landscaped professionally. And professionally means by the Olmsted brothers. The Olmsteads, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted had died by this time. He died in, I think, 1919. But his two sons had taken over, and that was a, a, a uh, landscaping company that had as its, in, in its credits things like Central Park uh, and, and a lot of other really extraordinary um, uh, landscape designs. And so they were given the task of designing the landscape at the manor house. One of the things that's on the table over there is the correspondence on the design of the manor house. And one of the things that's reflected quite a bit in that correspondence, a friend of mine got it from the National Archives, but, but one of the things that is on there is, well, we have to get that tree moved because Mr. Taylor's coming tomorrow. You know, things like that. There's a lot of that. The Taylors were really overseeing directly. So and they, they had a house in... Uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. I'm coming. But anyway, the Olmsted brothers were the top-notch landscape designers uh, of the country at that time. The house was built in two years, which is really amazing when you think about it. I mean, that's a huge house. And of course, what's important is this is 2021, and that was 1923. So it's coming up on the centennial. I hope that the town of Portsmouth will do something and, and really you know, commemorate that. Anyway, the grounds took a little bit longer than 1923. They didn't actually get to move into the Glen Manor House until 20, 1924. So the plan, they had a, an individual by the name of Percival Gallagher of the Olmsted Fern. He was, he was the main architect of the uh, thing. And the, the, this thing we found over here in the uh, National Archives has a whole bunch of letters from Gallagher and to Gallagher about what he should be doing next. And uh, it really was, a, it's, it's really a fascinating thing to read. And of course, Pope was involved in the landscaping somewhat too. They all communicate with each other. So Pope said that in, in one of his letters that Moses Taylor was not happy about the landscape that had been done at his home in Mount Kisco, New York. Mount Kisco is near Buffalo, as far as I can remember. Uh, and that's where the, the Taylor family was when they weren't down here. So every detail had to be approved by the tailors. And you can see that in the correspondence. It's really, really interesting. And HAC had perspective. Before they thought about building the manor house, 
he had set up tree farms all over the uh, property so that when they planted trees, they would be planting mature trees and not seedlings. And that was really important. On March 2nd, 1923, Gallagher submitted a plan to Pope. It was approved. And the plan would be planting 61 large trees, 256 smaller trees, and moving 29 trees from adjoining property. Cost estimate at that time, $50,000. I did some checking on that in terms of one of these things of, if it costs this much then, it costs how much now? $750,000 for landscaping. So, a lot of the, there was a lot of use made, though, in the landscaping of local people. This is important about Glen, the Glen Farm all the way through. They used locals a lot. And so, when the trees were being moved and things like that, a lot of that was being done by, by local companies, local landscaping companies. And Moses and Edith began, spent their first summer there in 1924. That first sentence is obvious. He took a lot of personal interest in the landscaping. And uh, again, as I said before, he, the, the tailors are coming. We've got to move that tree before they get here. So important to understand, though, and this is, this is crucial to the whole Gilded Age idea and Newport and, and everything else. Summer houses. Summer houses. Not planned for year-round occupancy. And the summer season quite often was... was July 4th to a little bit beyond Labor Day. And, and why I say that as far as September is concerned is the Newport County Fair was always a week or two after, the, uh, after Labor Day. And the Newport County Fair was really important to these people in terms of their competitive, competitiveness. They actually, they planted carrots in sifted soil so they would be perfect. Yeah. Amazing. And very competitive with each other. And of course, the competition was somewhat between the, the owners, but a lot of it was between the locals who were, who were working on the farm. Yeah, it's really, really a big deal. The Newport County Fair started in 1898, and it, it finally crashed in 1934. That was the last one. That was really big, a big agricultural competition. Okay, so the neighbors also, uh, Sandy Point Farm, Oakland Farm, etc., were developed uh, as mainly summer homes also until William H. Vanderbilt, who was born in 1901, he inherited Oakland Farm when his father died on the Lusitania in uh, 1915, but he didn't claim it until he was 21 years old. But he lived there most of the year. He lived there enough of the year that he could be the state, representative, state senator from Portsmouth and ultimately, in 1938, the governor of Rhode Island, William H. Vanderbilt. Really interesting character. I, I met one of his daughters once, and, and really interesting, the stories of, of the Vanderbilts. And Alfred Gwynn was just unbelievable. His, his big thing was coaching, that he would uh, you know, have... A, four horses, all absolutely identical, you know, carrying a coach. They had a, a coaching arena on Oakland Farm that was so big, they could take a horse and four and ride around in circles on it. Probably rectangles. Uh, but it was really big. One of the, at one point when it was built, it was the biggest in the United States. All of that sadly disappeared in the 1940s. Anyway, William H. was there for a long time, and he lived there most of the year, although he had a house in Newport and he had a hotel in New York. Okay, so the farms themselves, they, they competed fiercely with one another um, and, and in competition. And again, the competition was sort of among the owners, but a lot of it was among the workers who obviously, you know, took care of each other and argued with each other and played baseball with each other. So Moses married Edith Bishop in uh, 1896, and 
she lived until 1950, and she was at the manor house after, uh, long after Moses died. More about her as we go on here. Okay, Moses died, <coughs> and in the middle of the era of the Depression, he had a fortune of 26 plus million dollars. That's hundreds of million dollars at a time when the economy was in the, uh, having a disaster. So Mrs. Taylor, after he died in 1928, she took over running the farm and later married a man by the name of G.J. Guthrie Nicholson. Nicholson was a, an entrepreneur from Texas and Alabama. He was a businessman too and, and had, in, was involved in oil industry and a whole bunch of other stuff. He was, he was very prominent as well. So they lived in Mount Kisco, New York, near Buffalo, but increasingly they spent time at the Glen Manor House. And again, supervising everything that went on there. I've talked to some people who were farm workers back at that time, and <laughs> they would occasionally say, here she comes. Yeah. Mrs. Taylor would wander up to the greenhouse and see what was going on. And she would say, I thought there were three of those red roses yesterday. Yeah. She really was uh, on top of things. She was quite a lady. So Glen Farm became a showpiece for, the, for the, sort of, for the neighborhood. <coughs> Greenvale was another one, which I haven't mentioned, by the way. And Greenvale is the, the only one of these farms that is still a gentleman's farm. Okay. It still functioned in the same way that these did. Anyway, uh, <laughs> keep in mind, all of South Portsmouth, except for these huge farms, were small individuals working on farms, on, and it was all farmland. Okay. Until. <laughs> Here's a couple pictures. This is the manor house as it was built. You can see uh, the, the pond on the left, which as soon as the town took over the manor house, they filled in the pond. They didn't want brides and grooms going swimming. The one on the right is the, uh, the laundry and where some of the hired help lived. But it was, it was just beautifully landscaped. Extraordinary. And here's a closer view of it and the pond. And <clears throat> Mrs. Taylor sitting on the veranda there. And this is looking the other way. It was nice. I, some, I'm, and I know some of you remember, because I remember when that pond was there. They, the, the town filled it in pretty quickly. And they also had gardens down over the hill, over the left. And some of that's been restored, but gardens like this. Really beautiful. I think this was mostly a rose garden. So, am I doing my time? I don't want anybody falling asleep on me here. Okay, so the Glen provided uh, work for as many as 50 families all over, and a lot of them lived on <clears throat> Glen Farm houses all around. You go down uh, some of these streets and so on, there's a lot of houses that look like, you know, they were workers' houses, and they were. The livestock competed not only locally, but nationally. There's a, uh, a brown folder up here, a brown book about the, the cows, almost the whole book is pictures of cows and all you know champion this champion that and so on there's a lot of that and the gardens were extraordinary as well <clears throat> around the fourth of july the public was invited to come to visit there was a gate by the way uh, interesting the gate was uh down glen road right before you make the turn to get down to the manor house there's a house on the left there which is in the same style stucco of the uh, manor house. That was the gatehouse. And the gate went across Sandy, uh, Glen Road from there. That was really the only access in. And you know where the gate is? It's still around. It's down in Newport at, uh, I'm going to forget the name. Uh, hmm? Belcourt. 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 Yeah, it's at Belcourt. And, and there was a T in the middle, and that's been replaced by a no, there was a, yeah, I don't know. There's a T in the middle of the gate, 
It was for Taylor. It's for Tinney now, too, I guess. Oh, it was Tinney anyway, anymore. Yeah. yeah. There was another access at the foot of James Point Avenue, and just as you come to the curb, there was a road that went all along the water, and yeah. up at the, uh, at the pier and the, uh, and the, and the boathouse. I think, I think it was a dirt road, wasn't it? I don't think it was paved. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. So anyway, they also had some competitions of their own baseball teams. Here's a picture of their two baseball teams, the farm team and the garden team. <laughs> they played against each other, and they also went out into the town some to compete as well. This was, again, in the, in the 20s, maybe 30s. So the public would be invited to come and see a game on a Sunday afternoon sometime. Mrs. Taylor was very very generous about access to her farm. Not, you know, under control, certain times, certain days, but, but she, she, she wasn't a hermit, let me put it that way. Mrs. Taylor was a great donor to this town, by the way. She donated a wing on the library. Uh, she financed some of uh, the, the restoration of this building. And, and yeah, she did a lot. And most important was during World War II, she converted one of her barns into a hospital. And it was all staffed and everything, just a, an emergency hospital in one of the horse barns down there. I have pictures of that. Not on the slideshow, though. Anyway, she was quite a, uh, uh, although she was a, the highest taxpayer in the town, uh, she contributed a lot to the town as well. She's buried in Sandy, uh, St. Mary's, as far as I can remember. I think so. Anyway. So, the, after the Taylors moved in, the farm was, as I said, 500 and some acres. And later on, well, I'll, I'll get into this. This isn't in my presentation. But when Reginald Vanderbilt died in 1925, uh, the Taylors bought Sandy Point Farm as well. Amazing. Anyway, and Mrs. Taylor donated Sandy Point Beach to the town, by the way, too. Um, so the family spent the summer season, July to Labor Day here, and increasingly when Edith and, and Guthrie were, were here, they stayed a little bit longer. They also had a house in Charleston, South Carolina. So they were world travelers too. This is a really interesting sidelight trip. They decided to charter a boat a yacht in England to take a cruise along the western coast of Africa to the Cape of Good Hope, all the way down alongside. And the passenger list, this is the entire passenger list, Moses Taylor, Esquire of New York, Mrs. Moses Taylor, Miss Tiffany of New York, Mr. Wilmerding of New York, and Surgeon Captain H.G. E. South, Royal Navy Medical Officer. That was all the uh, passengers. The crew was about 56. Okay. On this cruise, let me try to have a picture of it. Yeah, I have a picture of it coming up. Dr. South kept a log of the journey, and he titled it Diary of Happenings Aboard the S.Y. Iolanda 1882, 1882 Tons. Okay. I was on a Navy destroyer that was 2,200 tons. So it's almost as big as a Navy destroyer. Anyway, this was later published in a, a, a limited edition of 50 copies. There's a funny story associated with this. I went one time to the library and looked to see if we might have had a copy of it there, only to find out that it had been donated to somebody. We did have a copy of it. And Carolyn worked very hard to get it back, and she did. And I. I in, in, in the days when I was doing this kind of research, I copied the whole book. It's over here on the table. The whole cruise, including a couple pictures of, of Mrs. Taylor cutting Mr. Taylor's hair on the boat and things like that, and all the things they saw. Anyway, they left England on January 13th and 
arrived at Cape Town on February 19th. Stayed for a week, turned around, went back. But when they came back, they went into the Mediterranean. And they went to Italy and visited somewhat with uh, uh, Moses' sister. Okay. Anyway, it's a really interesting journey to read, journal to read. And this is what the boat looked like. That's a picture of it in the Panama Canal one time. They actually went around the world in this thing a few times. Isn't that awesome? Wow. That's luxury. And, and there were a lot of boats like that back in those days. Strange. So they went in the Mediterranean and after a few stops concluded their trip at Monaco on April 5th. And Dr. South, writing this journal, uh, had a comment at the end. He said, au revoir, dear folk. You've given one person a damn good time anyhow although he's a Britisher. <laughs> Ave ad que vale, Henry Erskine South. And then he says at the end, the last line, God help us all, the boss has bought the yacht. <laughs> he did, he bought it. I don't know what he paid for it. He purchased the yacht, and eventually it came back to Newport. It was in Newport, and it was here for a while. I'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute. So they purchased the yacht. They, they really used it for a lot of overseas trips. I think they went around the world two or three times. They went to Europe a lot on it. And eventually, in 1940, Mrs. Taylor donated it to the British Navy for the grand sum of $5. So they could use it in the war effort before we got into it. So it was kind of a, a sub-chaser in the English Channel. And I've seen two different stories about the fate of it. One is that it was sunk and another that it was converted to some other kind of a barge after the war. I'm not sure which is the true story. Anyway, that's luxury living, I'll tell you. The Glen Farm husbandry. I assume you all know what husbandry is. It's about the raising of food and cows and everything else. There's Harold Gulliver in this country lab. It's, a, it's a, an article up here in a brown folder that he wrote with a lot of pictures of cows. Not a lot, of, no pictures of the people, just the cows. Anyway, he said, and I'll, uh, it's a pretty small print, I'll try to read it so you can hear it. In over 10 years of travel in this country, he's the English by the way, in this country and on the other side, I've never seen a farm where animals are so generally thrifty. I did, did not observe a single diseased animal of any kind. Each and every one seemed to be in the peak of condition and it would take only a short time to have them ready for the show yard. And all this is accomplished without pampering the animals in any way. Through heredity and environment, animals here seem to be possessed of robustness to an extraordinary degree. And at that time, there were Guernsey cows, Black Angus cows, Percheron horses, which are kind of clunky horses. They're, they're dray horses for plows and things like that, not for riding. But they also had thoroughbreds, saddle horses, and horned horned Dorset sheep. And at their Annandale farm in Mount Kisco, they raised wire-haired and Welsh terriers, wire-haired fox terriers and Welsh terriers. So Henry and Moses were the guiding hand of the animal raising. They were very much into that, in spite of the fact that they were you know, huge, big businessmen as well. But the, the success of Glen Farm, a lot of it was due to the fact that there were very dedicated Farm, uh, farm hands, local people who worked on the farm, and many of their descendants still live here. Do we have any here? Any descendants of the farm workers? I'm just curious. One? Okay. So among those families, and here are some of the names that you might be familiar with if you've been around very long, Manuel Camara, Arthur Howell, Charles Wilson, Charles and John Burroughs, Franklin Wilbur, Charles Gifford, Henry Fisher, and John Martin, among many, many others. I'm going to get done, people, don't worry. Okay, so an article in the Times in 1972 identified three of the workers on the farm who were still around. Arthur Howell, 46 years. Manuel Camara, 51 years. Henry Fisher, who was the farm manager, 49 years. That's devotion. <laughs> so the workers were divided in, on the farm between farm workers and garden workers, and of course they probably were a little bit competitive with one another, and they also had the household staff, and here's a picture of the household staff at some time. 
They didn't want to pose for pictures. <laughs> anyway, that's, and they had, again, the small building at the northern end of the, uh, of the house was the laundry and some storage and some of these people lived up there, upstairs. A lot of the workers lived in farm-owned houses. And by the way, when, when the farm was broken up, Reginald, Van, Reginald Taylor uh, worked hard to give a lot of those houses to the farm workers who were living in them, rather than selling them. That was in the, in the mid, 50, late, mid to late 50s. Anyway, so like Glen Road was a lot of uh, farm workers there. And the head gardener house, which is still there, down just below the barns and a little bit north. Uh, behind it were a series of greenhouses. You can see them here in the, in the, on the left-hand side. The, some of the foundations are still there for those, but the greenhouses, sadly, are all gone. Another farmhouse that I would imagine everybody has seen this one is the Leonard Brown house. It's, it's funny when you talk to uh, people from out of time say, that's the Leonard Brown house, or that's the Brown house. No, but it's yellow. <laughs> anyway, that Leonard Brown, Leonard Brown was a really big time farmer, especially in the 1850s and 60s. There's one book that was written about Newport County in, in 1878 that says that Leonard Brown was the most distinguished farmer in the state of Rhode Island. And this was his house. Okay. And he held, he, he sold it to Henry Taylor in, I think it was 1902. He was one of the last farms uh, acquired. Also, on, along the shore, below the house, we had an absolutely extraordinary boathouse. Isn't that gorgeous? A lot of us remember that. Uh, the Taylors couldn't moor Iolanda in the river. It was too shallow. But she had a sailboat called the Newport, spelled French, and that she kept there. And she was quite a sailor. She was very capable of sailing by herself. Sadly, the boathouse got vandalized in that dead period when nobody knew what to do with the manor house and uh, it had to be destroyed. It's really sad. That should be 1970, not 1770. <laughs> Gee, one typo in the whole presentation. Huh? <laughs> oh, well. Going back a little bit, Edith d dissolved Glen Farm as a business in 1939 not long after she married Guthrie Nicholson. But they continued to spend their summer times there a lot and other times in Charleston, South Carolina. Mr. Nicholson died in 1950, Mrs. Nicholson in 1959. Control of Glen Farm was given over to her son, Reginald Taylor. And his, his intention was not to occupy it really, but to, to dissolve it and sell off parts of it. Not out of any, I mean, he was a businessman from up, up and around Buffalo as well and very successful. And so it was a matter of, it's, this thing's hanging on down there. We got 500 acres in Portsmouth. What are we going to do with it? So we sold some of it in 38 acres to the Female Academy of the Sacred Heart in Providence in 1960. And they moved to Elmhurst Academy, which was up on the east side, uh, up around PC in Providence. Uh, and he, they moved it there from Providence in 1962. They built the schoolhouse and they built the chapel there. I have a picture of it coming up. Before I go to that though, this was something I came across just the other day. This picture is on a brochure advertising the sale of the manor house, 1960. Guess how much? $195,000. <laughs> You're going to see in a couple of minutes what the town paid for it. But that was, and that's what it was sold to the school, the girls' school. 195 grand. Wow. And this is Elmhurst School. I think most of us remember that. Day and boarding school. Some of the, the girls lived in the manor house. It had opened in 1962 and was not very successful. In 1972, uh, they wanted to sell the property. At that time, the town was having problems with public schools, condition of public schools. The Henry Anthony School behind Town Hall and uh, Ann Hutchinson School and Cogshill School were all the elementary school, well, 
than the other one too. But the schools were in, in bad need of repair. And so they, they talked about the idea of, hey, here we can get a school already you know, built 10 years old that is in move-in condition. These were, these were, a lot of you remember, these were pretty tempestuous times in the town of Portsmouth. What are we going to do with this? So the town wanted to purchase it primarily to get the school building. That was their main interest. A lot of discussion, a lot of anxious town council meetings. We had a special town meeting and a referendum. And this is something, looking up these statistics, that really surprises me. The population of Portsmouth, probably in, in 1970, 72, was probably around I don't know, 12,000 maybe. And here's the vote. They voted to purchase the school, 1,109 to 600. Where was everybody? Wow, I think that's amazing. The council authorized a bond issue of $1.35 million to make the purchase in July of 72 and took ownership of the school that was in move-in condition. Again, you know, is that a good deal? Yeah, it probably was a good deal. But there was a big problem. And the big problem was the purchase included the Glen Manor House. What are we going to do with that? Interesting. There were a number of people in the town who said, bring in the bulldozers, knock it down. Anyway, the school committee had control of the property. So the school committee had control of the Glen Manor House. They didn't know what to do with it. And so they turned it over to the town council. And the council decided to appoint a committee to decide the disposition, the Citizens Advisory Committee. It was under the leadership of Barbara Kearney and Richard Cosimini. And I was on the committee, along with about 12, about 12 or 13 of us. What are we going to do with this thing? I mean, it needed a lot of work. Where are we going to raise money? How are we going to get money to do something with it? Well, Richard and Barbara, I'm sure a lot of you remember them, were very aggressive people. And they said, come on, we can do it. Let's go. And we had some really fun meetings back in those days, trying to decide how we were going to set it up. And, and early on, as a wedding palace or special events place to compete with a lot of the mansions in Newport. We had a long way to go to get it into condition for that. But anyway, it was kind of fun, and, and we had that Citizens Advisory Committee for a long time. It has turned into the Glen Manor House Authority, which is still functioning. And uh, I was there from, I think it was 72 or 73, until I think I left in 98. So I was there for a long time. And, and the whole time I'm going to meetings in the Manor House, I look around and I say, wow, what was it like to live in a place like this? And that, more than anything else, inspired me to write this book that's up here on Gentleman Farms, which is mainly about uh, Oakland, Glen Farm, and Sandy Point. I mean, I just, I got so into this. It's just sitting there in a meeting, you know, everybody's blabbing on about different things. You know, <laughs> look at that bookcase. Wow. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I did that all the time. Anyway, so we were very fortunate that uh, a number of people began to get enthusiastic about it. So it was a drain on the town's budget, obviously. Just the heating bill alone was humongous. I think it was like $45,000 a year, something like that. And, uh, and it, was, it was really criticized. But the committee worked hard and began to find some ideas about special functions and weddings, and money began, began to come in. And of course, a lot of the money that came in, in the early days, the money that came in was used by the Manor House Authority to restore the building and paint it and clean it up. I remember it was really expensive to get the whole outside stucco washed, power washed. That was a big, big expense, but it needed it badly. So money began to come in and eventually the Manor House became self-sufficient. And not now, it is making money for the town. It's, it's a money maker. So under the inspired leadership of Katie and Don Wilkinson, who have been there for a long time, and they've done a great job, Don with the outside and the grounds and everything, and Katie with everything else, 
Uh, it's become self-sufficient and is a big, there is a considerable town income. Uh, again, that the idea of the manor house keeping all the money didn't last very long. <laughs> Eventually, you know, percentages began to go to the town. Now, it's, I think it's at least half, if not more than that now. Anyway, the Manor House Authority, and there's another organization called the Friends of the Manor House, which are all volunteers. Uh, the Manor House has a great reputation in, in the area and uh, is booked forever. It's hard to get a booking in it. Okay, beyond that, after we had this going, Mason Phelps, who, uh, who owned a big chunk of Glen Farm, and he was a descendant of the Taylor family. He had run his International Jumping Derby at the Glen Farm for a number of years, but he decided he didn't want to do that anymore, so he put the property up for sale. The asking price now was $3.5 million. Long way from 195000 huh? Anyway, times change, values change. So we had more public hearings and more contentious discussions. We had people on the town council who decided that, that the whole, what is now the athletic complex at Glen Farm would make great house lots. And look at how much money the town would make from that. Think about it. Anyway, they did finally make a resolution that the property would be used, and this is a quote, for open space and recreational purposes. Thank God. And it's a tremendous asset. I've talked to other I walk through the Glen almost every day, and, and I've talked to some of these coaches from other teams, things like that. Well, how did you get this? You know, we have a brickyard. We have a dirt pile where we have our local kids playing sports. I'm almost done. Glen Farm has come a long ways from the day when HAC put together his farmland and created his gentleman's farm. It's, it's, it's a really fascinating story how one man with the resources could do that. And again, he did it there, the Vanderbilts did it there, the other Vanderbilts did it there. We are so blessed, really, because a lot of this has been compromised, sure, we all know that, but there's still a, lot, a heart of it there. The horse barn at Sandy Point is still there, even though they tore down all the other buildings. Um, Reginald Vanderbilt died in 1925, and after he died, the Taylors bought uh, Sandy Point, but they didn't keep it for very long. Um, okay, so the Glen Manor House is approaching its centennial year, again, the year of completion, 2023, and hopefully we can have a big celebration for that. I think it'll be great. We are most fortunate to have Glen Farm and the Glen Manor House, as well as Oakland and Sandy Point. It's really a unique part of the town. And here's a couple final photographs that I took back in the days when I used to fly around here in a helicopter that really show it nice. I mean, this is about, about 10 years ago. Again, a lot of these supplementary buildings on the right-hand side especially are gone. If you look closely at this picture, See the house, that was the house of the, the, one of the managers there. Look behind us, see the sty rating and everything? That's the results of the ruins of the uh, greenhouses that were there. You can see that was the wall, you know, across there. What a gorgeous complex though. That's, I just love to walk through there. I do it a lot. And then of course the final picture, it is the final picture. <laughs> hey, that's pretty good, one hour. That one. Well, what a show place. And think about it, all that land was under their control. There's lots more to talk about with Glen Farm and with the other gentlemen's farms. Uh, I think I probably kept you long enough though.
long enough, though. Uh, I'll be happy to answer questions if you have any. Appreciate all of you coming. It's a great crowd. Thank you. If, if you ask questions, I'll try to repeat the questions so that everybody can hear. And, and by the way, you may or may not know, we're, we're videoing this, and it's going to be on local access TV and um, on the computer. I don't know what you call it. Some people from North Carolina wanted us to put it on Facebook. But on YouTube. YouTube. It'll be on YouTube. I have, I have about 22 lectures on YouTube. Anyway, and I am, as Ann said, I'm looking for new subjects. It's, uh, I'm running out. <laughs> One of my favorite right now, because of the, the things I have mined from Panagio's uh, collection, is steamboats. I got so much stuff on steamboats. Wow. Question back there, somebody? Yes. Uh, uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, I have a question, but a little quick story about Guthrie Nicholson. According to my family lore, when, in addition to being a very wealthy and accomplished plumber, and when he lived on Sandy Point, my father would call him to uh, solve our plumbing <laughs> issues. That's interesting. Speaking of Sandy Point, uh, as you know, my my father owned a uh, little smoking farm where he lives now. But he bought it in 1940 from Bill Vanderbilt. Hmm. So do you know uh, how he came to go from the tailors, apparently, to the Vanderbilt? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, my house is on the corner of East Main and Sandy Point, and <coughs> we're in Alfred Gwynn Vanderbilt's horse pasture. <laughs> However, I put 42 trees on the property, so... <laughs> That's interesting, though, that he helped that. Because he was, he was somewhat uh, incapacitated for about the last 10 years before he died. And uh, so he just sort of was at Guthrie Dickelson. He was at Glen Farm, uh, you know, sort of w finishing up his life, I guess that's probably a polite way to say it. But, uh, but how does that farm where you live now kind of be owned by the Vanderbilt instead of the Taylor? It's a good question. You know, I, I never, I haven't researched, I know... I know that it was Alfred Gwynn Vanderbilt's pasture, which goes back to 1902, and he died in 1914. Uh, I know it was then. I, the, the Little Slocum Farm is an interesting place to, to research. I've done a little bit, but not much. And, and I think that's, that whole area there is kind of fun. But I sit at my desk in my, in my office, and I look straight ahead, I see Oakland. I look to the left, I see Sandy Point. I look to the right, I see Glen Farm. Perfect, except for the damn traffic. <laughs> but anyway, any other questions? Yes? What did the balance sheet look like for these farms? Did they actually make money, or were they just being subsidized by the owners of their I don't think they needed to make money. Uh, I think it was really more show uh, and competitive show with one another. I, I really don't think they were, you know, huge money-making operations. I mean, not commercial. They weren't, they sell horses or sell cows, you know, things like that. But, but a lot of it was, you, you look at this, this brown book up here, champion so-and-so, champion so-and-so. That's, that's what they were doing. Yeah. I don't think they were doing it to make money. They had money elsewhere. <laughs> Question in the back. Jim, what was the story on the Red Cross house? The one that has the old Lions Club sign and I've heard people say they used to roll bandages for the war. The Red Cross House, if you go down the Glen, and if you go past the athletic fields, past the polo field, on the left there's a house there that probably five years ago was uh, falling down. Yeah. It was the Red Cross House, and we've had trouble trying to put a name on it. We've been talking about that a lot. And it was one of the farm managers. It was built, actually built in the 1940s. And yeah, it was the closest house to the barn where they had the, the hospital. So yeah, they, they worked doing Red Cross stuff there. And I guess that's where the name came from. But uh, it, was, it was one of the farm workers' houses, but it later became, Mason Phelps lived there after, you know, in, in the uh, 50s, I guess it was. Yeah. So, yes. Mrs. Taylor was the head of the Red Cross Support Center. Uh, Newport County, I think. Newport County. Yeah. Well, but originally from Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. And she was very proud of that. So there were a lot of activities and 
a lot of the women from the Glen came, and it, it was the Howells that mm -hmm. were That's at, the at that house. Yes. And so, like every Saturday, the women would come, and they would go up and do some things yeah. like that. But the, uh, there were a lot of purposes for potatoes grown and things like that for the, for the uh, war effort. Mm. But that it, they, the people that lived on the farm, especially the women, all the red because that's really mm. Yeah, they, the town owns that and they put a new roof on it and new downspouts and so on. And there was some consideration, I don't know if this is still hanging, uh, a woman who was involved with polo somehow wanted to lease it and use it for a and b And I don't know whether that's still active or not. But, yes. Are they working on it now? Yes. Okay, I haven't been down there. Maybe that's the people who were... It's a nice house. I mean, really, I, I had tea in the sun porch of that house about 25 years ago, something like that. Uh, but anyway, yes. Just an observation. I was looking at some other uh, book about the history of Portsmouth, and um, I was uh, um, shocked by the lack of trees. But with so many farms now, I understand why. I mean, in this yeah. one picture, it, just had, it was just fields, and you couldn't see a tree anywhere. Damn, trees were in the way. They were in the way so a lot of yeah. them Come to my property, 42 trees, okay? And it was, th and 30 years ago, there was nothing on it. It was a pasture, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Anyway, I was a little nervous that windstorm last week. Oh. Yes? When I was a child, I lived in the Brown House. Ah. I was born there in 49 and, and lived there until 1966. And the uh -huh. Brown House was rented out. It was not for the farm workers. But um, I remember it as a child, a very young child, going down to the manor house, and we then called her Mrs. Nicholson because that's what she was then. Mm. Um, she would sit in those big chairs that are on either side of the entry and hand out Halloween candy. So she wasn't even <laughs> there until until later in the year. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was, and then years later when the uh, school, when Elmhurst, when it was the Catholic school, um, they used the manor house as dormitories mm -hmm. for, for the girls. And when I was a young teenager in the summer, I would clean the dormitory mm. in, the, in the summer. And my mother worked as, as the cook for the nuns who were cloister nuns. Oh, huh, interesting. And, uh, yeah. So lots of magical <laughs> Great. <laughs> yep. Any other quick questions? Because I want to give you a chance to go up. I'm sorry? The Glen Ridge Farm. Glen Ridge Farm? Glen Ridge Farm is up to the, nor the north of Glen Farm. If you go down... Yeah. Yeah. Has it been sold? More house lots, huh? No. No? No. Oh, good. I hope not. Great. Oh, that's good. So what's the history of that? What's the history of that? Well, uh, again, on that north side of the property was a, I think it's still there, uh, a, like a barn building that has, the, where the chauffeur kept the cars and lived upstairs. Uh, I think that's all. I haven't been down there lately. I think it's still all there. Is it, yeah, Gloria? That's one place that the new owners want to, want to fix up for themselves. Yeah. So that's where the chauffeur, the cars were kept. I don't know. They're so cute. <laughs> they are. I don't know. Yes? Yeah, no, I talked to the prospective uh, buyer at that property about a week ago. Uh, the dog got loose on my lawn. <laughs> the dog was chasing some uh, turkeys. So uh, he came running down and I talked to him. He was a nice fellow from Boston. He's hmm. And uh, he, uh, he had planned not to go back to the alpaca farm, but he could have made it into a visit. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. It's really on the side of the hill there, but it's, it's, it's nice. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. Is the Briar House in its original location? The Briar House? Yeah. 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 Ye
Brown House? As far as I know, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've seen, the, the picture I showed you is from uh, 1922, uh, but it, I'm, I'm sure, and I have articles that talk about Leonard Brown as being such a prominent farmer. And of course, his, he owned right down the, the road, right down to the house, and all the land. I have pictures of cows grazing and, and everything on, on either side of the, uh, the road. Okay, well, I'll, I'm going to stick around a little bit. If you have any other questions, and if you want to come up and look at some of this stuff up here, please feel free to do. Thank you very much. <laughs>